All right. Alejandro, thank you so much for joining us today for the girls. We're so excited to dive into your experience, your vision for motorsport and beyond. You have had a massive career in politics, business, motorsport, founding Formula E, Extreme E, now E1 and Extreme H on the horizon, which is super exciting. Yeah. But to rewind yeah. a bit, talk to us a little bit about your background and potentially leading the witness here, but maybe how the unusual combination of your marriage and Fernando Alonso's world championship helped launch <laughs> your career in motorsport. Yes. Yes, yes. So uh, my background was really in politics. So I did politics since I was 18. When I was in university, um, I graduated in economics, but I, I really politics was my main uh, passion. And I did politics until I was 31, 30, yeah, 31, I think. The last thing I was doing was I was secretary general of the EPP, which is the center-right coalition in the European Parliament. I was also a member of, of Parliament, of European Parliament. And um, then I started dating my wife, which was also the daughter of my boss at the time, was the prime minister of Spain. So I decided <laughs> to stop politics. And, uh, and then um, we decided to get married. So I didn't really have any job. And then um, Flavio Briatore, who was in Formula One, I was a good friend of mine, had this young kid. Um, and he said, this kid is Spanish. If uh, And no one uh, is able to, to, to you know, Bernie can't, cannot sell the rights of TV in Spain. Nobody wants them. So let's try to get the rights. And then if this kid is good, you know, we may, we may do a good <laughs> business. And that was the beginning of my motorsport career. Uh, the kid was Fernando Alonso. He went on immediately to... Uh, win races and then won the world championship and uh, yeah and, and and we did really well with that and from there everything else is history. <laughs> Love it. We're we're big Alonso fans on the podcast, um, especially this year. So yes, jumping a little bit into Formula E and Extreme E, I'm sure you dealt with a certain amount of skepticism when you launched it. So what were some of the biggest challenges you faced getting it off the ground? So with Formula E, really, the, the challenge was that nobody really believed it was going to survive. Everybody thought it was going to just, just die. Uh, and then, of course, people don't want to join a project that is going to die because, you know, they, they it, it, it's not good for their image. It's not, it's not good for their finances. I mean, you know, you lose money if the project dies. So, um, yeah, it was really hard to get people on board. We had some good surprises. So we had some early coming sponsors and we had some teams that came early. But it was very hard to to you know get rid of that um, impression that people got that we were not going to last. Then um, when when Liberty Global and Discovery came on board as shareholders, that all changed, and people thought, oh, if they have these two big corporations backing them, maybe this thing is going to last. And then a lot of people started coming, a lot of manufacturers started joining, more sponsors, so everything changed. And in the beginning, really was the belief that we were not going to survive. Mm -hmm. And how did you overcome that? <laughs> well, <laughs> it was not very easy. We had to sell a lot. We had to tell a lot of the story. <laughs> we had to convince a lot of people. We have to just basically uh, keep trying. And, you know, we got every every 20 no's, we got one yes. So <laughs> That's we were just collecting those yeses and then, you know, ignoring the no's and, 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 and keep going. But it was, yeah, it was really hard. Um and, you know, we were very, very close to going bankrupt a few times. It was really, uh, you know, in a lot of sleepless nights. But, uh, but yeah, then in the end, we had the, we, we were able to turn it around. It was not easy. I can imagine. So we want to dig in a little bit to the sustainability angle of both Formula E and Extreme E, of course. Every organization these days seems to claim that they're green or aiming towards net zero in some way. But we're starting to see companies and organizations get called out for greenwashing, maybe misrepresenting their impact. As sort of the expert on that, what are your standards for sort of measuring true impact? And how do you feel your series are setting an example for others to follow? So I'm a bit contrarian on that uh, kind of whole movement of uh, these people, you know, that uh, accuse others of greenwashing and they think that they can like allocate uh, passports of who is uh, green or not. I think, um, you know, everybody has a role to play. Having said that, uh, you know, there is, it's, it's important for, for, to have people that raise awareness and raise the, the alarm, if you like. Uh, but then the, what's, real, what's really important is to make changes that are compatible with um, economic growth, with our way of life. Like people is not going to sacrifice their way of life for the environment. They're not. And if we try to do it, 
on that premise, we will fail. People will change their habits as long as um, it's more practical and makes more economical sense for them to do it. So when, a, when an electric car is cheaper and better than a combustion car, people will buy it. But they will mm -hmm. not buy an electric car because they want to save the planet and they're, they're going to spend twice the money on an electric car. No, they won't do that. Yeah. And, and we can lie to ourselves as much as we want, but, you know, we will not solve the problem by telling ourselves things that will not happen. So for me, it, it's all it's all part of a long transition, long transition that is going to cost a lot of money. It's going to cost a lot of energy, a lot of effort. We're going to need we're going to need a lot of energy. We're going to need a lot of fossil fuel energy to get out fossil fuel era. Um, solar panels are, 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 are made with energy. Wind turbines are made with energy. Uh, and, and that energy is not coming from solar panels. It will come from fossil fuels. And then that will help get rid of the fossil fuels. Mm. Um, so we have to take this, as a, or we have to take this a, a, on a realistic approach. So let's do and say and apply things that work. You know, that's, that's kind of my, my, uh, my philosophy in this, which I think is maybe a bit different from like the normal people that are involved in environmental you know, action or climate action, if you like. I think I am involved in environmental action, but from a pretty realistic point of view. Yeah. And a big part, just to follow up on that, a big part of things that work, I do feel like start at the local and the community level. And I know Extreme E is very involved in that with its legacy projects. So very curious, you know, depending whether you're planting trees in Senegal, educating children in Greenland or helping with forest security in the Amazon, has there been a particular legacy project that you're most proud of? I, I think what we, what we try to uh, do with these legacy projects is really to send a message that um, everyone can play a role. And, you know, uh, adding roles and, and, and having a discussion helps a lot in general. I mean, you know, the, the effect may be very small, but but it's very important for the people who do it because that will help change the mindset of the people that are really participating in every in every project. You know? And, uh, yeah, the projects, I mean, they're great everywhere. Um, I particularly like the one in Senegal. The, it was really nice, and it was also in the beginning of the uh, Extreme E, and it was one of the first ones that we did with those those villages that we, uh, you know, we, we had an intervention in, and the beaches that we cleaned, and uh, all the things that we did there. Um, but we found fascinating ones, like, for example, the ones in uh, Sardinia, because in the beginning we thought maybe we only find interesting projects in, like, very remote locations. You know, you think of the Amazon, or you think of the mm -hmm. ice cap in Greenland or whatever. But in, in Sardinia, which is, you know, very close, uh, which is one hour and a half flight from London, um, the project of the Posidonia Oceanica, so these, these kind of forests, on the water forest of uh, of this algae that absorbs so much CO2, is really a huge CO2, it's a carbon sink, how to uh, reforest those forests, if you like. It's almost a work of art with these little needles mm -hmm. and people like sewing the plants to the bottom, these divers and so on, and seeing that you can really have that effect uh, so close to home, I think it's also was also really fascinating. Or you know the studying the the wildfires also that happened in Sardinia yeah. and how mm -hmm. climate change has affected yeah. the temperature uh, of the of the soil just just a few centimeters below the the ground. You 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 have you have temperatures of the of the sand that are that are like twice that what they were only a few years ago. So yeah, all, all these all these projects are really interesting, and even if they can be small or big, but the important thing is to participate in them because in change, it changes your own mindset. Yeah. So it's shifting gears a little bit to talk about, of course, Extreme E is a leader in sustainability, but also in, in diversity. When it comes to pioneering women in motorsport, what was the thought process behind making gender equality such a key part of your mission? And where are there any lessons that you took away from that? So, you know, I, now, gender equality is, is something that is like very, very much on top on top of the agenda uh, for everyone. Yeah. But but for for me, for me, it's really been something that has been like almost like a like a mission or a or a I don't know if a passion, a mission or a, or or a, for like over twenty years uh, in racing. So I about twenty years ago, I started a Formula Three team in Spain uh, where I where I had uh, wanted to do an only female team. And I did a test. I, I we did a test in the track in Valencia. I remember in Cheste, and I still have some pictures of that test. I look really young. 
<laughs> and uh, we we brought all the female drivers that we could find that were you know racing competitively around uh, Europe and America, and we test uh, we tested all of them on on the GP two cars that we we, we brought there, and um, yeah, and then we chose two, and they and and we actually uh, me personally I financed a full season for two, um, for two girls to to do the whole season in Formula Three, but it didn't work. It didn't work for many reasons. First, it didn't work because because they didn't succeed uh, on the sports side, and that was frustrating for them. And um, and also, it didn't work on the sponsorship side. So I thought there would be companies interested in sponsoring female drivers, but there wasn't. There was we tried, we did pitches to so many companies, and there was zero support for that. Interesting. Um, I know, right? So I basically took it as a lesson and 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 always kept it in the in the back of my mind, like how how can I change this? Um, you know, because you never know if a woman will be faster than a man or, or in Formula One. The fact today is that there are in there. Um, but I wanted to find a solution that would allow women and men to really compete on a on a like a same kind of uh, uh, platform and same kind of level. And tennis gave me the solution, which was the mixed doubles that yeah. uh, Wimbledon. And I thought, why don't we do a mixed doubles in racing? And then it doesn't matter if they go faster or slower. They're both equally important for victory. And that was kind of the idea. We came up with that during the during COVID, uh, brainstorming on how to kind of, because I, since then I was trying, and, you know, we had also female drivers in Formula E, and it was the same. Uh, they, they didn't succeed on the uh, succeed on the sports side. In Formula E, in Extreme E, there is always women in the podium, in the top of the podium, because they're mm -hmm. part of a team, male and female. And I think it's also important that, uh, for me at least, that I like to show men and women working together. You know, sometimes we live now in a, in a world in which there is uh, this kind of, trend to kind of oppose men and women, I think is the opposite. I think men and women is the best thing possible. Teamwork makes the dream work. I love that. And it seems like such a simple yet brilliant solution. Um, we're excited about it. Just to follow yeah, up really but, quick, are there any things that you're really excited about for the future of women in Extreme E and in motorsport in general? Well, I, I think, you know, what's been really interesting is that the, the, the time difference over these three years between men and women has, has really shrunk. Yes. So they're, they're, they're catching up so quick. So it means that if you give female drivers enough, uh, uh, you know, track time and the same machine as the guy, and here there's so much the same machine that they basically jump into the same machine. So they basically, one goes out and the other one goes in. Um, women can catch up. So it would be really fascinating to see one woman really, uh, you know, succeed in Formula One or I just think we need to see more women in motor racing in whichever uh, capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was sad to see that the W Series didn't didn't continue. Now they yeah. have the F1 Academy, which is you know I think is a great project. Anyway, the the more we see uh, female racers, the I think the the best for the sport and uh, the best for everything. We totally agree. We talk about that all the time and appreciate all the work <laughs> you're doing. Um, so kind of on the topic of F1, there are a ton of F1 names involved in Extreme E from Lewis Hamilton, Nico Rosberg, Jensen Button, McLaren. The list goes on. How does F1 benefit or can they benefit from the strides your series are making, the technology you're deploying? In your opinion, is F1 moving fast enough on the sustainability front? So I think F1, uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, has a lot of heritage, of course, great heritage, amazing heritage. But the heritage also conditions you if you want to change direction quickly. You know? um, I think extreme age can be very interesting for Formula One. Uh, because hydrogen, who knows, could be a technology in the future for Formula One. At least it's one of the potential technologies for Formula One. Because I don't think Formula One is going to go to battery racing. I think that's yeah. for Formula E. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of talk of uh, e-fuels, synthetic fuels, carbon neutral fuels. But potentially hydrogen could be even a better solution. So to have a testing ground, to have a championship that uh, it's, you know, goes ahead with hydrogen, like Extreme H will do, Maybe something that that could be very interesting from the technology uh, point of view for Formula One. In any case, I'm a big fan of Formula One. I think Formula One is doing a great job. Um, I love going to Formula One races. You know, I've been around Formula One races for 20 years or two more, <laughs> 20 years plus. So I really, for me, Formula One is is part of my life. Yeah, I want to dig in a little bit to the hydrogen question and hear a little bit more about that vision because. We know it's it's potentially huge for the envi environment, but one of the big challenges is you know producing that in a green way from renewable sources, which is difficult. 
how are you kind of approaching that problem with extreme age? So hydrogen, hydrogen is not really a source of energy. You can say hydrogen is a fuel because it's a fuel, but for, hydrogen is really a way to store energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, hydrogen has been around for forever. Uh, hydrogen in in the industrial processes, hydrogen is a byproduct. But of course, it comes uh, out of very very polluting processes. Um, so now, what 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 they've done <laughs> is to put colors in the hydrogen, colors which only uh, mean where the hydrogen is, uh, how the hydrogen is produced, mm -hmm. because the hydrogen once it's produced is hydrogen. So all the hydrogen is the same. You don't have hydrogen I, A, B, and C. It's just hydrogen. So green hydrogen, the one produced with re renewable energy, it's it's especially interesting. And why? Because you can produce this hydrogen in places that, that have the potential of a lot of uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, like, like deserts, like uh, places with a lot of wind. But normally, people don't live there. And uh, if you produce solar energy in the desert, uh, but there is no people, then you just there's no use okay, for that yes. energy. You need to you need to either have a cable, but you don't have a cable strong enough to go from you know the desert in Saudi Arabia to Europe, or you uh, have to find a way to store it in something that you can transport, and that is green hydrogen. Green hydrogen, you got you you can transport in different ways. You can you can uh, do it as ethanol, or you can do it as green ethanol or green uh, uh, methane. I mean, there are different ways. Uh, then you have to retransform it in hydrogen, and then you can use it uh, as a way to fuel, uh, well, the energy we need in in in, for example, in Europe. So that's why it's so interesting. And then in motor racing, <clears throat> there are two ways to use this hydrogen. One is to uh, use it uh, uh, with the fuel cells. So this is the the way you can produce electricity. So basically, you you use hydrogen to power an electric car in a way, or you can burn it you can have hydrogen combustion. And that mm -hmm. one has one thing that some people like a lot, which is noise. It so, makes yeah. noise. <laughs> so, people don't want to give um, that up. <laughs> no. So why not? You know, But the combustion of hydrogen is still on a very early stage of development. Hydrogen is very... Um, first of all, the, the, the atoms of hydrogen are very small. So they, 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 there is leaks. They can, they can escape the containment. And second... Um, they're very aggressive on the materials, for example, inside the cylinder. So you need to find materials that can resist the combustion of that hydrogen and, and on, 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 a, on a longer period. But, you know, all of this is technology R&D. And, you know, that's what sports do well. Sports is the platform where you can develop technology. So so I think the potential for a, for a hydrogen championship is, is huge. And, and that's that's the role that I think Extreme Age will play. Super exciting. Yeah, we've been having those conversations with people too, people who have been to extreme races and love it, but it does kind of in their minds feel like two different things. So it's cool that we're kind of developing towards both. Switching yeah. gears a little bit, because this is something that we talk about on our podcast a lot, is the the drive to survive evocation of F1 or the growing fan base. Of course, you know, there's a lot of different opinions, a lot of different things to say about that, but of course, we see a massive growing fan base of increasingly younger and increasingly female fans, which we love to see. So tell us a little bit about your series. What's the fan base like? What do you hope that women and girls watching the sport are taking out of it? Well, what I can tell you is I'm very jealous of the what does survive uh, effect in Formula One. I <laughs> wish I would have had the same for Formula E for Extreme. No, uh, so I wish I would have had. I, I think they've done a great job. Uh, I like it. I haven't seen all the episodes uh, because, you know, if you're, too much in the inside sometimes you know it gets kind of you know already what's what happens but right. but i think it's done great for the sport and uh and for the female fans i i think they're really lucky um we're trying to you know achieve the same uh without netflix uh but uh you know it's not easy to build a fan base we are slowly it takes a long time to build a fan base yeah. and uh, we, you know that's what we're doing from like nine years now all the races are are packed full of people, but uh, but it takes time, takes time, and uh, yeah, we have just to be patient and keep going. And the younger the audience, the better. I think that has been a great thing for Formula One to to be able to catch a kind of a new generation of fans. Yeah, yeah, and it's so fun to see women drivers. We spoke to Emma Gilmore from from McLaren, and mm. I mean, for us, it's so fun to see a really high performing female doing so well. I think that's a huge thing that women and girls can take out of it too, just to see people like them up there. 
I think so. I think, and I think, like seeing the woman fighting for victory um, gives a different motivation. You know, if you're okay. following woman driver and she's always the last one, uh, then uh, you know it, it's not nice. Uh, yeah. you, you want to see women winning. Yeah, yeah, it was great. We got lots of fun pictures of Emma on the podium from Scotland. Super exciting. Oh, so to wrap up, we ask everyone we interview this question, and it's somewhat related to what we were just talking about, but. You've taken a lot of risks. You've paved an unprecedented path in motorsport. You've created huge impact. What advice do you have for those who are trying to break in and do similar in the space? Well, the usual advice would be like, you know, keep doing, you can do it, believe in yourself and all that. But, you know, that's <laughs> that's kind of like, um, you know, I don't know, from a movie or something. Um, <laughs> it's tough. You know what I mean? It's very tough. And many people don't make it. So just don't ruin your life uh, thinking that you're going to be like, you know, the best in motorsport. Just give it a give it a proper try, but never forget, like, to have a plan B, to go to university or to have a job or to have some kind of thing as a backup. You will that can even help you perform better because you will have less pressure when you're trying to, you know, win a race in a junior category or something like that. Like, you know, I've been dealing a lot with, you know, with your fathers of the drivers, which is like, you know, <laughs> a lot worse than deal with the drivers. Um, and, you know, sometimes <laughs> the, frust the frustration is really bad. So I think, uh, you know, give it a try to in motorsport. I think it's a beautiful world and uh, not only driving, but also engineers, mechanics, whatever. And have a plan B if, that, if it doesn't work. That's great advice. We love, love that. It. Well, Alejandro, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. We know how busy you are, and we are so excited to keep up with what's happening in Sardinia this week and next weekend. Thanks. Are you going to come to Sardinia? Well, you're we invited wish. if you want to come. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful place. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you, Alejandro. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.